Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Change Management webinar. I'm Corinne Bonnevité, and I'm part of the marketing team here at ILEX Group. Um, so this is our second session of the day of this Change Management webinar, and we had very good feedback from this morning's session. So we hope that you will enjoy it as much as we did. On the housekeeping note today, so feel free to ask questions along the session. Andy West, our uh, project and change management expert, will try to answer as many as possible. You will receive the replay by email, but please stay until the end as we have a special offer for you. You can also follow us on our social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, to keep you updated of our upcoming events. We also ask you to fill a quick survey after the webinar. It will take only um, a few minutes. Um, so now, um, over to you, Andy. Thank you very much, Corinne. Hello, everybody. Uh, as the slide says, I'm Andy West, uh, Project and Change Management Skills Trainer. We're directly working for ILX. I'm the course director for our wider uh, syllabus project management courses and change direct and course director for the change management course as well. Uh, involved in change for a number of years now, I think is the best way of describing it. Um, the purpose of today's webinar is to look at change management as a subject and particularly the impact change has on middle managers and the influence that middle managers have on change. So to try and look at the impact they can have on the success or failure um, of change and to try and suggest some strategies about how we might improve things how I might look at improving change management using our middle managers more than anything else. Um, what I would like to do is kind of look at what is change, what are middle managers, um, how do we generally see middle managers within the change sphere, how to influence it, um, why we see the failures, and then have a look at some of the theory, theoretical stuff, um, what sort of things we might contribute to that, and then look at some things we might do to try and improve that as we go forward. Um, as Corinne said, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them as we go through. Um, they'll make sure I get them and I will try and answer these as I do so. So the first thing to consider is, um, what is change? What do we mean by change? So I simply went to the dictionary and, and kind of grabbed the definition. Uh, we're trying all these sorts of lines. Um, to make the form, nature, content, future, uh, course, etc. of something different from what it is if it was left alone. And there's the important thing, is that change is about deliberately doing something different. If we leave things alone, that's kind of the status quo. That's kind of leaving things as they are. Um, it's the altering. Um, the important thing here for organizations is change is a natural thing. Change is evolution. If we leave things as they are, because the world keeps changing, what we're doing sooner or later will lose its effectiveness, will lose its purpose. Um, and in commercial terms, of course, that does mean that organizations might choose to go elsewhere. So change is something that we actually have to do as organizations to keep up with the world, technology and all those other sorts of things. Um, there's been some interesting discussions on LinkedIn and various other kind of forums about change or transformation. Um, change being seen as changing something you've already got, and transformation is doing something completely different. Now, what's interesting is that in organizations, both of those are seen as projects or multiple projects and programs. They're about how we alter what we are as an organization, how we behave. So in lots of ways, this might be a question of scale. And I'm going to use the term change kind of inclusively to cover both of those things. Clearly, the more we're changing everything, the more we feel like we're moving to transformation, the more there is to cope with. And therefore, perhaps the greater the need for control and support and involvement of all interested parties. Um, we're not really going to make mention of projects and programs. Projects and programs are our delivery mechanisms. And clearly we need effective delivery mechanisms in order to make these sorts of changes. What we're looking at is the kind of more holistic, how do we as individuals, as teams, and as organizations change? So how do we behave? Um, what helps us change? What doesn't help us change? and the sorts of things we might need to make us to help us change more effectively. So that's the kind of thought process. That's kind of where we're going. So the theme was change in the middle managers. So who do we mean? Well, 
within organizations, we always have kind of structure. So here we go, we've got a structure. At the top of the organization, we always have the senior management, the owners of the business, the chief execs, um, the people, if you like, strategic planning. Where are we going as an organization? Frontline staff, very much, are all the people who actually carry out the day-to-day -day operations. They're people who provide service to our clients, our customers, whoever they might be. And between them, we've got the middle managers. Importantly, the middle managers have kind of got there. They're in charge of a division, a department, a section, teams. And one of the concerns about this is that having got there, they've built their little empires. And one of the common assumptions or feelings you get from reading lots of the material is that once we got there, middle managers are interested in essentially the status quo. Now, part of that is that their role is to ensure that the day-to-day -day management of the business is happening, that effectively the frontline operations are being carried out in an effective way. And therefore, there's almost a kind of desire to keep things working as they are. And if that becomes entrenched, then what we start to have is difficulties in changing. Um, one of the quotes, and this, I'm just taking this from uh, the Effective Change Manager's Handbook, um, is it's a case study quote, and it says, one CEO was seeking to generate fundamental change across his organization. He believed the executive management was committed and that much of the shop floor level was committed. Yet communication seemed to get lost in the middle, in what he termed the blotting paper layer. So what we're saying is that as, if you like, direction and vision comes down, it gets diluted, it gets kind of shoved to one side. The, the change doesn't really get to the front line. It kind of stops in the middle. Um, within another quote within the same book, the same reference material that I'm talking about, um, they talk about the middle managers as potentially being an inert and highly absorbent blockage. They're kind of in the way, that comes out of the blotting paper idea, of it stops in happening, it soaks in all this change and just kind of lets little bits through. The second quote there, the corporate concrete, was actually a phrase coined by a managing director I worked for um, in a previous organization which I worked, and that he found that the strategic team of which he was in charge of were focused on changing the organization considerably. The frontline staff often had some dissatisfaction with what was going on in the day-to-day. -day. There had to be better ways of doing things. But in the middle, we had this kind of corporate concrete who were set in their ways, who were kind of, this is how things have been done and this is how things are going to carry on. And if this is true of our middle managers, then what we have is a lump of people in the middle who then essentially resist change, whose reason is to keep the business as usual going as the business as it usually is, without looking at change in the future, a kind of short-sighted vision. Um, essentially what they're doing is translating the, kind of the strategic into the tactical, but missing out all of the change ideas, ensuring that there's a level of consistency as we go through this. Um, I'm actually convinced that not all middle managers are like this, and I'm hoping that some of the things I'm going to talk about later on are very much what middle managers are about. But if we do have this kind of blockage in the middle, then this is very much one of the key reasons of like, failures in change. We have something in the way, a major barrier. One of the ways of looking at this is to look at Gareth Morgan's um, uh, metaphors for organizational uh, movement. Now, Gareth Morgan uh, identified eight different metaphors. And the purpose of these is to give you a quick understanding of what the organization is and how it works. Um, and you deliver change in those, those uh, metaphors in different ways. Um, I'm going to look at two of them a bit later on, machines and flux and transformation. What I want to do is just a very quick overview of what they are. Um, to actually kind of deal with these. Okay, so the eight metaphors that um, Morgan talked about, uh, the first one, machines, it's already on the slide in front of us, was that the, the organism, the, sorry, the organization works like a machine. Every piece has its place. Essentially, if you want to change things, it's almost like taking out a component, improving the component, and putting it back. As long as the connectors are good, then we can upgrade things without changing the overall machine. In machines, change is very much driven from the top down. Um, flux and transformation, on the other hand, is almost kind of a complete opposite. And what Morgan was talking about was where change happens at the bottom. The organization is essentially like chaos in action. Um, as 
the organization bumps into different things in the environment, changes start to happen. They pick up the, so there's very little centralized control of change. It kind of happens at the edges. Um, and this is often uh, common in very fast moving um, development organizations where they're trying to you know, change as they bump into different environments around them. Um, the other six, just for a very brief kind of overview, we have organisms, which is just about um, a central entity having to evolve. Uh, this links to some of Senji's ideas about kind of evolutionary change in organizations. Um, the important thing about organisms is that the communication has to happen across the organization to ensure that there is a level of consistency in what we're doing. Um, unlike flux, where everybody changes individually and may go in different directions, we want organisms to evolve and adapt as a kind of a whole, so the whole organism is considered to be effective. Um, Morgan also talked about brains where the knowledge of the organization is, is held in kind of people often or teams um, and therefore often what's written down is not what you need in order to make the process work. You have to go to certain people to do so. Change in those uh, organizations is usually focused on having the right people involved. Um, cultures. Uh, Morgan talked about um, organizations where it's culture that brings people together. There's a shared belief system. This is the right way of working. Now, what's interesting in those is that you kind of need the weight of change, the kind of the opinion of the organisation to start changing the the behaviour patterns, what's acceptable, what's not. But it is about kind of moving as a group similar to organisms. Um, perhaps a more common one then is political systems. With political systems in our organisation, what we have is have we got the right people in charge? Have the people in power? Are they behind this particular change? Um, the interesting thought process about political systems is they're always winners and losers. The winners are the people who have the power to make the change happen, and the losers are the people who try and oppose those sorts of changes. So it does do change, but it does create that kind of undercurrent of loss. Um, the last two that Morgan talked about, and other people have added, I'm just going to finish with Morgan ones. Um, we've influenced domination. Um, the issue of domination is like a... a an extreme version of a machine. People no longer consider people they're merely um, units of work, or units of production. And essentially it's about how can I minimize what they're doing so they do the right thing the way that I want them to do it. So it's an extreme version of that. Uh, and you might say that the traditional and very uh, focused production line organizations might fall into that kind of, uh, kind of pattern. It's I want you to do what I want you to do in the way that I want you to do it and just keep doing those sorts of things. Um, the last of uh, the metaphors is something called a psychic prison, which I would hope, as an individual, doesn't exist in normal work organizations. The example they normally give is of cults. Um, in most organizations, the, the rules and processes are clearly explicit. This is how we want you to work. Within psychic prisons, those rules are implicit, and failure to follow those rules actually is hugely disappointing to the kind of the leader of those. It's a kind of a personal slight. Um, and so people have to try and intuitively work out what the rules are. And it's often kind of seen as a, a kind of slightly negative way of an organization working. As I said, just a quick overview. What I particularly want to use to use is machines and flux and transformation and look at how middle management can affect those particular two metaphors in the delivery of change. If we have the machine metaphor, if we have an organization where change is driven from the top, what we're going to look for essentially is the long arrow that change starts at the top of we need to do something different and the change is cascaded down to the very bottom layers. The problem we have is if we have that layer of kind of corporate concrete as our middle management, it might survive the first translation down into the layers of management, but then it gets blocked before it actually reaches the front line. So the idea is that the change may be triggered, but it doesn't cascade all the way through because vested interest in maintaining the status quo dilute the needs of the change, the purpose of the change, and therefore not all the change, and sometimes no change at all, actually reaches the bottom. So the organization doesn't keep evolving. And that's almost that kind of vested interest, as I've talked about, in the middle of the management layer. If we look at the other end of the scale, the flux and transformation, what we're looking for here is the ideas bubble up, that people in the organization have these great ideas, which they can then push up into the organizational layers. Now, if we're encouraging those sorts of things, what we need to make sure in lots of ways that if we're going to do this appropriately is that the best ideas are kind of picked up and then shared across the organization. 
if we have a middle layer that is trying to prevent those sorts of things, then changes go up and essentially stop because we don't want these things to go any further. Um, an example I can give you of this is that I work for an organization that introduced an idea called employee involvement. And the purpose of this was to get all the staff in the regions and in the, if you like, in the operational functions to look at what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, work out what's working, what wasn't working, and to suggest improvements, which they could pilot in their own area, and then will be spread across the rest of the organization if those sorts of ideas worked. My manager at the time, essentially one of the middle, middle managers, firmly believed and actually told us that people in operations don't have good ideas. All good ideas or improvements come from the head office. And as part of our if I, uh, problem solving groups, we were required to pass our progress and our ideas to him so he knew what we were talking about and what we wanted to do. And what would happen every time we passed a potential idea, a potential improvement to him, was that that idea would suddenly appear from head office as if they had had that idea with one or two little tweaks. It wasn't exactly what we talked about. And essentially what he was doing was that by taking those ideas and passing them into the organization, they were then being fed down. And the people at the bottom, essentially the flux, the looking at all those sort of changes, were kind of disengaged from the process. Well, why should I look for problem solving uh, opportunities if they always vanish, if somebody takes them off me and delivers them elsewhere? And so by the actions of that layer of management, my manager and a number of others like him, the entire process of employee involvement was kind of stifled. And probably after about three months at the very most, as an initiative, it had died out in the organization. So this big cultural change, which kind of launched from the top of the organization to work at the bottom layer, was stifled by the middle bit. So that's a kind of important process. We have seen these things in the past. I've experienced these things in the past. And it's what can we do to try and minimize or prevent that in the future? So that's, if you like, the organizational context. Um, if we look at a more personal level, when people go through change, they go through a series of kind of emotions, a kind of process of dealing with that change. Um, the model I'm going to put up is the Kubler-Ross curve. Now, this was developed in 1969 by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and it was originally for um, how people react to uh, imminent death or to terminal disease. Um, it's been adopted within the change community. It's called a kind of the change curve, but within inverted commas, because it really is about briefment. But the stages are the same. And so what happens is you kind of go over this curve as you go through. So the first step is shock. There's been a change that something's happened. Um, it may be a big shock or a small shock, but we always start with a piece of sh bit of shock. And what's interesting, if you notice on the graph, morale, energy, performance goes up because what happens is that people start to perform better. They're going to denial that says, if I can prove that I'm really good at this, then they won't do the change. Essentially, we kind of pretend that it won't happen. Of course, it's going to happen. And what then happens is they go, well, that's unfair. That's not, I mean, we won't do anything wrong. Why should we do this? This anger and blame is often externally focused. And so it is about kind of raging against what's going on. But it does show that people are unhappy in this. And their morale, their performance starts to drop because they're kind of unfair that they're being put upon. It goes further down with the next one. And I often personally believe this is kind of one of the worst, the kind of the bargaining self-blame. In um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's work, there's often called bargaining with God, which is, if I change this about my life, then this won't happen. This was my fault by doing this, if I can do something else. And this is when people going through change start to blame themselves, and they start to internalize this. And this, of course, is quite dangerous, because what they're starting to do is kind of go, well, it's all my fault. This is that I deserve these sorts of things to happen. And this leads into the lowest point, which is kind of the depression and confusion, where people are kind of going, well, where am I going to go? Where do I go from here? Uh, this is a kind of a just thing to happen to me. And if you like, in, in common analogy terms, we're in the tunnel here, but there's no light at the end of it. What we need is the light at the end of the tunnel. What we need to be able to see is that there is a way out of this, except that this isn't something that's being done to us. Um, it's just part of change. And if we can move into acceptance, it's knowing that you know there is a way out of it, things going on. The final curve of this is problem solving, is what do I do next? Where do I go here? Now, 
as we're going through this curve as individuals, and we all go through this curve at, at different paces and to different degrees, we need some support. We need somebody to help us through this. And of course, the people most able to help us are our managers. So if you're a frontline staff, it's the layer above you. If you're that layer, it's the layer above you. If you're the top of the middle management layer, it should be the senior management. And at each of these stages over the curve, we need slightly different things. So um, first thing is warning. If we have no idea that there's going to be a change, if it comes as a complete shock to the system, it feels far worse than if we knew that there was going to be a change. Again, if I give you an example, um, I work for an organization, um, very sales-led. Every year, the marketplace changed, and therefore the sales teams were readjusted to face that marketplace in an appropriate way. And once that had happened, then the administration functions, of which I was a part, would be reorganized to support the sales functions in the most appropriate way. And we did this for every year. So every year, people were expecting this kind of change this you know, reshuffling of who do I work and where do I work for. And because of that, the shock wasn't as great. When I left them, well, there was a major reorganization. And what they decided to do was rather than just kind of if I, moving people within teams, we would shut the region offices and move everybody to the head office. And the reason that this was such a shock was that the announcement came at the end of year celebration and Christmas party. And essentially it was, we've had the best year ever, you're all wonderful, we're going to close your office. At this point, the shock, because it's something completely different, is very high. And the denial in that group of people listening to it was, did I hear that wrong? And the problem here is, is that there's a, there's a great deal of denial, and then of course that's going to move in very quickly into quite a lot of anger because of the nature of the shock. When people are moving into denial, what they need is consistency. What they don't really need is if like vain hope that if they do wonderfully, it might not happen. If there is a need for change in the organization, then what we need is a consistent message for saying, yes, the change is going to happen. And perhaps also why it's going to happen. But we need that consistency of message. Without that, we kind of clutch at straws and hope, well, if we just keep working really, really hard, it won't happen. Um, assuming that's going to happen, what do we need? Listening. What we need is people to listen to us rage, allow us to kind of shout our objections, and if they're doing this effectively, respond to those, giving us reasons why our objections won't work. And um, we'll look at this a bit later on when we start to look at some of the skills involved um, in looking at how to improve this particular process. As we move into the kind of bargaining self-blame, what we nearly need here is support. And as I was saying before, I believe this is kind of the critical one. Because what's happening here is if people are moving into self-blame, they're starting to internalize this, and therefore they start to move away. They start to distance themselves from their manager and often from their colleagues, because it's their fault that it's happening. And so the warning signs for this are people who are disassociated from the team, who are not really contributing anymore, because they're starting to move into this kind of, it's my fault, This I shouldn't have done X, Y, and Z, whatever it might be. Um, interestingly, when I was first trained to be a manager, which is some years ago now, um, even as a frontline manager, the organization I worked for um, trained managers in both coaching and what they call performance counseling, which is not really about personal stuff, about you know, their big life problems, but in this kind of situation, why is their performance dropping? What are they doing to help people try and find a way out of it? So it would essentially help people move from if at this level, step number four, through into acceptance about what can they do next in terms of the problem solving. But it was taught because the organization believed that managers should have these skills to help people in this kind of time. Time and need. And it was particularly picked up when performance was dropped. And it was a, a way, essentially, of getting people to look at their performance and try and improve. So what it happened to do is essentially support at step four. And in step five, essentially provide a view of where they could go, vision. And this essentially, if you like, is turning the light on at the end of the tunnel. It's providing people with the thought process of where are we going to go? What's happening in the organization? What's going? And in terms of the, the ex acceptance, it's almost kind of the options of what could they do as they 
in terms of following that vision to move out of where they are at the moment, where are they going to go next. Now in our simple change in the organizations, it could be working for a different manager, it could be working for a different region, it might be picking up a certain new skills, a slightly different role, but these options are available. And of course, the last thing we need to do essentially is motivate our staff to achieve, to take on the new role, to do things they want to go and do. The important point about this is that if I as a frontline member of staff are going through this, so is my manager, and so is their manager. And so there is almost a need that these skills are inherent in all layers of matter of an organization, so that it doesn't matter where our people are, we have the right people doing this. Now, that does say, perhaps, if we've done it almost as a cascade, you know, have they gone through it? Have you gone through as a manager this curve already? You're out the other end, and therefore you're in a, a position to effectively provide that support to your staff as well as you, they go through it. But it does mean that there are layers of this. Different individuals will go through it at different times, different paces. How up they go in terms of their performance and how deep they go in terms of the dip, in terms of the, the depression, depends on the nature of change and how it impacts them. But it's have we got that support? As an organization, do we have those skills in place? So that kind of says that we are reliant on managers having those, those kind of emotional intelligence skills. The ability to support our people and if like the manager below them through this particular process. So let's look at our middle managers. Let's look at who they are really. The, quote, the heart of the organization, this comes from the book about change management. These are people who have invested in this organization. They've invested their career, their development, their learning. They've built themselves essentially a job, a role, a little kind of group of people, a team, maybe a little empire. But they've invested in that success and the people within it. They have a good understanding of how the organization works, what works for the organization, what's failed in the past they may well have seen. and they therefore have experience. And if we can tap into that experience and into that knowledge, we can use it in terms of change, in terms of improving the business as usual. Um, and it's, it's almost trying to, can we get them involved in this? Can we keep them involved in what's going on? So as a couple of kind of thoughts linking into this, what we have is just a kind of couple of quotes. Um, a standard project maxim, and this actually links, if you look at the body of knowledge from the Association for Project Management, they talk about five key success factors for projects and programs, which is that effective projects need effective senior management support. Well, if we're doing small scale changes in an organization, I need the layer above, the first layer of managers, to support that. If I'm changing things at a slightly bigger level, I need the layer above that. So have I got people who are willing to provide that senior management support. Essentially, all the skills in my previous slide, do we have the right kind of people providing the right kind of support? The second quote there is actually from Peter Senge and his colleagues when they wrote The Fifth Discipline. It actually says, profound change occurs when small-scale initiatives are skillfully nurtured by well-aligned leadership at all levels of the organization and then spread. And it's the all levels of management, all levels of leadership in the organization. That's the kind of critical one here. If we want to deliver effective change starting from the top, then the senior management, strategic management, must provide support and direction to the layer below. If we want that to happen at layer below that, then that middle layer must provide support, direction to the people at the front line. It sometimes doesn't matter where the change is triggered from, whether it's from the top or from the bottom. What we need is skillfully nurtured by that leadership. It's having the right skills in place. So as a kind of almost checklist, if we're dealing with, with middle management, the sorts of things that we might consider that we need to do, engage this middle management in the kind of the key role of enabling change. Um, first of all, uh, engage them in early in the change process, achieving a critical mass of support. If change is kind of dumped on them and it's all been decided it's we're going to do those sorts of things, then all of their skill, their knowledge, essentially is being ignored. Now, they may well say that they're against the change. Have we done something to understand why they're against the change? Is it just that they don't like change? In which case, we might need to manage that, particularly if they have a wide network of people that might influence. Can we minimize the influence? 
Or are they resisting the change because they've seen something like it before which failed? And they have some real objections to this. Now, importantly, one of um, Covey's seven habits was seek first to understand before you seek to be understood. Do we understand why they're doing it, what their objections are to this change? Can we use that as a way of actually engaging them in the process? And I have to say that I saw a, a, a facilitated meeting um, about change with a, the very good change manager. And he started it by actually talking to the group and saying, we intend to do this. What are your objections to this? Why should we not do this? and actually got the group to list all the reasons why this change was going to fail. He then engaged the group to seek how you might minimize those objections, how you might either remove them or you know, mitigate them in some way. But by engaging them early and asking those sorts of things and then using their knowledge, what he actually, by the end of the review meeting, had got was an entirely motivated group of people who were willing to move toward this change. And that's the idea of the critical mass, is what we're essentially we're moving towards the tipping point. We've got a great number of people towards it. Um, the sense of urgency and the need for change. If there's no sense within the organization that you know, change is just a nice to have, it's not something we need to do, then people won't need to do it. Now, in terms of theory, what do they call this? They call this um, survival anxiety. If there's no survival anxiety, then people don't see the need to change. Survival anxiety is essentially, if we don't change, what will happen to us? And lots of writers have talked about this and, and kind of said, well, if we want people to change, then we kind of have to make sure that they understand the reasons why they have to. And that kind of privileged access to the thinking. What's the stuff that we've talked about? What are the things that perhaps everybody doesn't know? And can we give you access to this so you can see the broader picture of what's going on? And if we can create that sense of we have to change because, then it allows us to move people forward. Um, the other sense of that, if you like, the, the sense of resist that is something called learning anxiety, which is the sense within people of I'm too old to learn, I can't learn, uh, learning scares me, I don't want to make mistakes. And the other thing we need to sense here in terms of uh, helping people move is the fact that everybody can learn, that whilst we're going through change, trying things out, uh, making mistakes, putting in temporary fixes, all of those things are acceptable parts of, of moving through a change process. So piloting ideas, letting people try things, and sometimes you know having to put up with some failures is part of that particular process. But allowing them to try things means that they can minimize some of their learning anxiety, which removes some of the brakes on change. It's OK that it doesn't work first time. It's OK to give this a go. So if we pilot ideas, we can get feedback, involve people in developing proposals, then we can make our change initiatives much more practical as we go through. Communicate, communicate, communicate. And the last one's an interesting one. If we're providing privileged access to the thinking, to the thoughts, our middle managers should know who their people are. Our middle managers should they be able to translate those high-level strategic views into why is this important for this department, for this section. They should be the people who have a much better way of communicating what's going on. Um, there's a nice quote that says in the book, it's actually from Cameron and Green, reflects some work. They say that change should be best heard from two different people. One, the senior management. Why are we changing overall? And this is often a high-level view. But the detail of what and how and when better comes from the line manager, because that translation helps people understand what's actually going to work here. Now, one of the key things that they talk about in lots of the change management um, readings and work is change agents. A change agent essentially is a network of individuals across an organization who help facilitate change. They have access to resources. They often don't know who they are, well, they have the answers to everything, but they know where to go to the answers. So they're an effective network. They can help with facilitation. They can help with kind of the support techniques. And my thought process here to go with this is, we have these middle managers. They're a network already. They are at the heart of our organization. 
Okay? We get strategy at the top, we get ideas from the front line, and in the middle, we have this network of managers. And this could provide, essentially, our change agent network, which says that perhaps what we're looking for for effective change in the future is not if it's like, you know, have our middle managers and then create a new network of change agents. It's to use the existing network of middle managers across our organization to do change. So the thought process here, perhaps, is that if you're in management, part of your job is business as usual. Part of your job is to make sure that what we're doing at the moment is right. But part of your job has to be about what do we do better in the future? Facilitating and encouraging change. And what's interesting, as a training manager quite a long time ago, the organization that I work for actually suggested as part of my leadership development that when I'm running the day-to-day -day of my team, I should have some part during a week where I wasn't planned to be doing anything, where I had the opportunity to think about the future and to think about improvements. And what they're trying to do is encourage me to think about change. And of course, if I've got a network of other colleagues, what I can then start to do is talk to them about what they've done and how they've done it. We have a natural way of spreading information across the organization because we are automatically a network. We talk to each other. Before I joined ILX as a senior trainer, I worked um, in a management development in a water company. And one of the things that was done as part of the major cultural change in that water company was organized events for all the management layers. So we'd have a kind of senior group that would meet, and then we'd have a wider management group that would meet. All of the managers across the organization were encouraged to meet, to talk to each other, to network, to share ideas. Essentially what we're trying to do is put these change agents everywhere in the business. So it doesn't matter where the ideas of change are coming from, what we have is the support network in place. And if you as a manager are trying to do change, you therefore have a network, colleagues you can go to, to pick these sorts of things up from. The sorts of skills that are suggested for a change agent will be these th sorts of things. Disseminating information, good ideas, best practice. Um, access to um, resources, tools, and things you might do. All of that kind of comes under the disseminating. The active listening, they're listening to people's objections, enabling them to find ways through it, and essentially supporting people through sometimes that change curve. Translating high level strategic ideas into to tactical things. What do we do at the bottom end? What do we do? Um, encouraging, motivating teams and individuals to work as we go through. We link into the supporting idea, which comes back to the listening in terms of making sure that teams work effectively. And then the facilitating skills, helping run meetings, workshops, problem solving exercises. Now, these are, in fact, skills we need all of our change agents to have. And I would suggest that these are skills that we want all of our managers to have. So if we're looking at developing our change readiness, our ability as an organization to change, are we encouraging and developing these sorts of skills in our line managers, our middle managers, so that when change happens, we have this natural group to support it as we go through? And so this kind of brings me almost to if I, the end of the things I'm trying to say, that most middle managers we have in our organization have got where they are because they've done change, they've learned things, they've moved up the organization, they've changed how things have worked, they've built a team, a little empire. If we allow that empire to stagnate, to not move forward, then the problem we're going to have is that they just manage the status quo. Things don't develop and our organization ceases to move forward into the future. What we need to essentially do is encourage our middle managers, all of them, to keep driving, to keep changing, to use the skills that they've already got to move forward. And of course, that encourages our staff to follow their link. So what we have is managers walking the talk, if you like the old phrases. That's the kind of thought process. So the point about this change in the middle manager, rather than build a change network of, of independent other people who are going to help change, are we enabling all of our managers to help change? This way, any change that comes through as an organization, we're ready for. 
I'm going to encourage you to ask a few questions at the moment. Whilst you're thinking of questions you wish to ask, one of my colleagues, Rachel, will just take you through a couple of offers that we've got, and then I can respond to any questions after you've done those. So, Rachel, I'll move you on. Thanks, Andy. That was very informative. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel. I do business development here at ILX. So, we have three options available for the training. The first is the foundation level e-learning. This is a 12-month license and starts from £315. The second is the practitioner classroom course. This is also run over two days and prices start from £660. We have these courses available in London, Nantwich and Birmingham. The last option is the foundation and practitioner combined course. This is run across five days and prices start from £1,025. We have this course available also in London, Nantwich and Birmingham. If you could go to the next slide, Andy. Thanks. Okay, we're also running an exclusive offer for all webinar attendees. This is a three-month change management foundation level e-learning license for £99. This offer is only valid until the 4th of May. All you have to do is quote the code shown on the screen when booking. To book this course, you go on our website, ilxgroup.com, or you can alternatively give us a call on 01270. 611600. Also, you can also email myself or my colleague Nadia at the details shown on screen. So I'm now going to pass you back to Andy for any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. So, ladies and gentlemen, are there any questions, any queries that you wish to raise about what we've talked about this afternoon? Any ways that we might help you on the subject of change in the middle managers? I still have lots of attendees, but no questions as yet. Ah, how do you, so, how would you address those middle managers that have tunnel vision and only look at what is relevant to them and not the bigger picture? That's an interesting question. One of the things you have to consider here is um, why do they have tunnel vision? Why are they only focusing on their particular area? Um, one of the important things here as an organization is to allow all managers to um, connect with other managers about the wider context of what they're doing. Um, one of the organizations I work for, one of the things they used to do to encourage this was to ask for every department, every manager, what is the output of your department? And who are your customers, internally or externally? Who are your suppliers? And then to go, what's your output? Is that what your customers really want? What you receive, is that what you really need? And what it's trying to look for, essentially, was almost that process idea of, can we start to um, pick up <coughs> you know, the connectors with the organization? Can we build those kind of links across the network? Um, if we have uh, managers with tunnel vision and they don't see anything in forms of change, then the point I made about um, uh, s uh, survival anxiety, can we raise it in them? Can we show them what will happen if change doesn't happen? That the, the context of survival anxiety is to ensure that people understand that there is a need for change and a certain urgency about it. Um, doesn't always help with everybody with tunnel vision, but that's the kind of working way towards it, I hope. Um, second one I had, can you repeat the name of the change book when you are finished? Thank you. The book I've used as reference is the book that's used as reference for the qualifications you've just seen advertised. It's called The Effective Change Manager's Handbook. It's published by Kogan Page and it's produced in conjunction between the APMG International, which is the exam body, and the Change Management Institute, who are the professional body that look at change management. So The Effective Change Manager's Handbook. Um, if you go online, you should be able to find that. Um, if you do want to take part in any of our courses, we often um, provide this as part of the classroom courses as you would need that. So it's part of, I believe, the purchase price, but I may be wrong. Um, what kind of format do these management events take? The classic team building scenario are more focused around sharing ideas, best practice. Um, if we're talking about management events within change, I would suggest um, the classic kind of facilitated workshop, how are we going to do a particular change? Um, often facilitated events, with, which may be team building, maybe about problem solving, the important thing is, is have I got the right people together 
to answer the questions I'm trying to answer. So if if we're doing the, the management events I was talking about at uh, the water company where I work, the large organization, these are often almost held as what were called um, world cafe events. The idea of the world cafe is that you get all the, the the attendees there, and they're broken into smaller groups, kind of set up in a kind of relaxed atmosphere. And there's a kind of menu of questions that you're going to go through as the day. So the idea is that you all start on the kind of the first questions, and then there's a sharing of what each group thought. And then you might move on to the next questions. And what you can do, and what was done in some of our events, was that we moved people between tables. So you didn't answer all the questions with the same people. Um, so a World Cafe event, is kind of a way of doing it. The other ones you can do is what's called the open source event where you get people to agree objectives. Again, in the change management's handbook, there's some interesting ideas on facilitation around those sorts of things. So they're often much broader events about trying to get people to talk to each other. Um, sometimes we did particular exercises to show what was going on and to um, essentially raise people's awareness of how they're behaving. Other times it was more kind of discussional about what they think was going on. So it was a bit of both about showing ideas of best practice, and sometimes there was a purpose to highlighting some um, inconsistencies or, in, or, or competence questions. Next question. Uh, I think I've just got that one. Yep, that came through twice. Hi, Andy. I've always thought of good change management practices as simply good management practices. Management is all about change, doing things, getting better, growing. I think your presentation support that view. Is there anything you see that specifically separates good management from good change management? Um, no, I think is the simple answer to that. What I would say is that yes, good management should incorporate good change management. Um, I think when we're doing change, as opposed to doing if like business as usual activities, we might have to be much more sensitive to how people are thinking, feeling, and behaving. Um, Good management would do that anyway, but in times of change, because people might change in how they're feeling and thinking much quicker, I think that becomes um, incumbent on the manager to be much quicker with recognizing what's going on and dealing with it much more actively. So yes, I think there's a broad correlation between the two of them, perhaps in change management, perhaps you're a little bit more sensitive than you might be otherwise. Next question, does a particular organizational structure ensure easier change control and manager are issues always the same? Um, with each of the metaphors that Morgan talked about, change can be delivered, a change is affected in slightly different ways and there are always pros and cons. There is no perfect organizational structure. It is merely, this is how our organization has developed and because of that it will have certain strengths. It will also have certain weaknesses. So the issues are not always exactly the same. Um, I've highlighted middle management today because that can be a blocking force in a number of those circumstances. Um, one of the other metaphors was the organism metaphor. And essentially, often, ideas come up. And the organism as a whole says, we have to change. And what it requires for the organism to evolve across the entire thing is good communication. And in that situation, if you have a middle management layer which is not networked, doesn't communicate effectively, then you find change doesn't work effectively at all. And I would suggest that the organism metaphor is utterly reliant on an effective middle management network to share information across the different divisions. It's, it, it can't wait just to go up to the top of the organization and come down again. It's got to be spread quickly across the tool. So there are variations of the issues, but I think there are some common issues that come in there, I think is my cop-out answer, I'm afraid. Um, can I repeat the seventh metaphor once again? Okay, if I repeat all of the metaphors very quickly, um, they are interesting ones. Uh, the eight metaphors that Gareth Morgan identified were machines, organisms, brains, cultures, political systems, psychic prisons, flux and transformation. I think the one you missed was instruments of domination. Instruments of domination, which essentially is a, a very extreme version of a machine. People are no longer humans, they're units of, uh, of units of work. Um, it's a very interesting read, it's a very useful part of change, it just gives you a quick shorthand understanding. Moving on. What techniques can be used for, for unengaging 
resistant managers. Um, and I think this actually is quite a broad question. If if you look at Roger's adoption model, there are always innovators and early adopters, and there are always people you might call laggards who 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 resist change for some reason. The important thing is to understand why. What's their behaviour pattern? Is it because they're telling you that this change won't work, or you know, it's it's not the right change for the organisation, or they're just telling you change is terrible? If they're giving you a reason for doing it, then it's about exploring those those objections. Um, one of the things I've seen here is um, you can always kind of use the persuasion thing. It is about identifying why people are saying those sorts of questions. So, you know, what's the problem? Um, why do they think the objections are here? What can I do about it? Um, and and you know, if they're saying this won't work, the question is why not? So I would suggest that it's often good question and good listening. Um, coming back to the idea of COVID again, if you understand their objections, you might be able to answer some of their, their queries, their points. If it's just that they don't like change, one of the things is 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 trying to engage them and suggest ask why not? All organizations have to change. And again, it's almost the survival uh, instinct of what will happen if we don't. And if you can uh, actually show in reality what would happen, not as a threat, as a kind of just a, as a piece of information, <coughs> without being threatened, without being bullying, then that might be a way of it continuing what's going on. So it is that kind of, you know, well, what would happen if we didn't do this? And if we can under, help other people understand that, again, it might be part of facilitated. Um, if you've got, Know, one or two people are very resistant. It's worthwhile doing that in a group where you have got some people who are positive because then what you have is some assistance in answering those questions. It's not you versus them. It's the group coming together to try and resolve those. So it may be sometimes it's worthwhile doing it as a group exercise rather than an individual one. If I can move on. What books do I recommend? Well, the book I've been using as reference is the, is the manual for the book, which is the Effective Change Manager's Handbook. Um, What's interesting is it then refers to lots of other things. So it starts to talk about uh, Senge and the fifth discipline. It refers to lots of motivational theories um, and other ones like that. Um, I also put out an earlier one, which was a guide to change management by Cameron and Green, which was an earlier one that looked at that. So if you look up Cameron and Green, um, and I think it talked about um, a guide to change management, something along those lines. That was an earlier one that was used in qualifications. Again, there's some, there's lots of very good theory in that. Um, that one is quite theory heavy, whereas the Effective Change Management Handbook has much, got much more in fact, practical tools in there that you might be able to use. So that would be the two in there. And they, they make recommendations and links to other lots of other books if you like that kind of reading, some more of it. Question, is it possible to make middle management responsible on capturing the ideas coming from the front line? It is. Um, one of the things here is it depends on how you want to do it. If I give you a real example of a more effective um, encouragement of change within an organization, um, an organization I work for wanted change to become part of what everybody did in their day-to-day -day work. And therefore, when they introduced it as part of everybody's appraisal was um, to give an example of what they'd changed in their day-to-day -day role. Uh, over that particular year. You know, I had to do one a year, but you had to be able to show in your appraisal you'd made a change. As a manager, I a, had to ensure that every member of my team had made a change in their day-to-day -day work and that and I had supported it, and two, that I had made a change in my day-to-day -day work as well. So there's a requirement for it's like me walking the talk. My team would only do this if I was willing to do it as well. And that was in my appraisal for over five years to ensure that we were essentially bedding in that kind of cultural change. So, Luciana, I hope that gives you an idea of how you can make that done. Essentially, you can put it into your behavioral systems. You can make it part of, this is what we do around here. Um, and it was just kind of the tick. Have you done one this year? Yes, it was. Um, it also encourages managers to think about ideas and how they support their people. Question says, do you think we need to get HR on board at this, at this approach? Sounds like a whole company solution. Um, yes, I would be thinking. If we build into, if we want to build into our middle managers uh, a responsibility that says that part of your job is, is running the day-to-day -day and, and doing the things that help the day-to-day, -day, and part of your job is change, has that been written into their 
appraisal? Has that been written into their job or that line? Um, it's kind of almost like the organizational development idea of, are we encouraging by putting if the right corporate systems in place to do so? HR have a role in assisting us do those sorts of things. And if we look at HR, some of the things I've talked about in terms of that skill development, does that come from our HR team? Does that come from our training team? Are they the same group? We might need new learning, different training, um, alternative ways that our people can learn new skills, attributes. Emotional, inter emotional intelligence has been a big area of development in kind of training and learning over the last few years. Those sorts of things would certainly help. So having HR involved, I can't see as being a bad thing because it is about development. This is about changing who we are as an organization. So, yes. Question, how do you break down siloed working? Now that's, this is one of the, the difficulties. Um, I have to say, I mentioned the, the, uh, the manager events that we ran at the, the water company where I worked. And part of the reason for those events was to break down that kind of silo mentality. Um, we did have various departments blaming other departments in front of customers which shows that we aren't one, cust one, one organization when we're going externally. And part of one of our um, big networking events was to show, as managers, how we were doing this. And we played, uh, we used a negotiation game within all the management teams to show how they were not cooperating and how, in fact, that was causing problems. So essentially what we're trying to do was move people through the, where the areas, the levels of of competence. Um, if you haven't heard of this, that there are four levels of competence. Um, there's unconscious incompetence, I don't know, I can't do it. Conscious incompetence, I know I can't do it. Then conscious competence and uh, unconscious competence, I can do it without thinking. If people are unconscious incompetent, if they don't know that they're doing it badly, then they won't learn a better way of doing it. Some way, some Sometimes what you've got to do is you've got to show what the silo mentality is doing and why we're doing things wrong. And if you can raise their awareness, they now know that these things are wrong and therefore we have the opportunity to move people into doing something better. So it, it doesn't have to be confrontational, but it, there needs to be some way of showing that what they're doing is not talking to each other. Um, so in the water company where I worked, we did it in the management team with a negotiation game called Win As Much As You Can, which I'm sure you can probably find on the internet somewhere as an access one. But it was that was a training material we used. Um, I also did it as a uh, physical exercise with a professional body. Um, as a, as a kind of, you know, it's a group outdoor exercise, and it's a game called Sheep and Shepherds, um, which is a very visual way of showing that you're, as teams, you're not networking, you're not talking to each other, and you're just working in the teams that you can currently work in. Um, but, so there are lots of techniques you can do, but it's about raising awareness is the first thing, and that's the important starting point, and then you can start people talking to each other. So if I can move on quickly. How does this dovetail with aspects of Prince2 Practitioner? Um, Prince2 is a project management delivery method. I'm a Prince2 uh, practitioner and trainer myself. What Prince2 gives you is a structure for managing your project. Change management is kind of the more holistic, but more things wrap around it. The Prince2 manual says you should consider doing stakeholder engagement. And change management is part of that you should consider doing. And personally, I would say you don't consider doing stakeholder management, stakeholder management you do it. So change management and stakeholder management is one of the things that I personally think you have to add to Prince2 to make the delivery of our projects actually effective. And if you don't do it, then what we will find is that there will be uh, problems because you're not talking to the right stakeholders. You don't get buy-in, and therefore you have those sorts of problems. So it, it, it's one of those things that Prince2 doesn't cover. It's one of the things that you need to add to Prince2 to make it work effectively. So I hope that helps in the future. Question, you mentioned set aside time to think about change and how to make things better in the future. How would you overcome the objective of people saying you're too busy overloaded to do this? That is one of the classic reasons that we don't think about change in a management layer, is that I'm so busy just doing what I'm doing, I don't have a chance to look forward to the future. Um, my answer to that would be about leadership development. If you're hugely busy, does that mean that you have too much to do? In which case, are there some things that you should delegate as development opportunities to your team? 
to the people within your team. And if you can de delegate some of those things so that you are not always running just to stay where you are, then you create some team. And that delegation actually means that you're developing your team at the same time. Um, it's, it's just like a kind of thought process. And I say it was a, a kind of attitude that was encouraged in the organization where I worked. And I personally think it actually says a great deal about the organization that we want our managers to be thinking about that, not running just to stand still. That, so it starts to encourage you as a, as a leader to thinking about, well, what things could be done effectively? What things would be developing opportunities for my staff? What things could I delegate to free up a bit of space for myself? Um, and if they go, I can't delegate anything, then it starts to ask the question of, of well, why not? And is it because they don't trust the staff or the staff have the skills? We are talking about development. Organizations, if we wish to motivate people, keep people, one of the classic things we do is develop opportunities. So it is about that kind of thought process. And as a manager, and I, do I have the tools to help with, with motivation? Again, I'm moving back to the softer skills of kind of leadership rather than just managing. I hope that answers some of that question. Um, let me move on. Can change also come from a middle manager, and how can this impact on both senior management and frontline staff? Change can come from anywhere, I think, is the best answer to this. Anyone can have an idea. And if, as an organization, we're encouraging change, then one of those things is, is, is how do we look at those ideas? How do we validate those ideas? And how do we share those ideas? And you know, with suggestion boxes, whether it's, you know, you can go your boss and say, I've got an idea, why don't we try? If as an organization we're willing to listen, to evaluate, and try those sorts of things, then we can try all sorts of ways of moving forward. So um, I think change comes from everywhere. Sometimes it's forced on us from outside of the organization. Sometimes it becomes because we can't do. And sometimes it becomes because people see there's a better way of doing it. Middle managers, one of the things about middle managers, particularly if you consider the, the phrase empire building, is well, if I can build on these two teams, they're effective because we can. Now, that may be a middle manager trying to do a bit of empire building. Is there a good reason for it? Does it save time and money? Does it release some resource, other middle managers, who might be used better elsewhere for other things? So it, it, it's kind of about encouraging the process and, and then managing once it started to happen. Um, changes could impact upwards because you might be moving things that change directorates or how you know, senior management work. It could certainly change how front line staff work, who they report to. So these things are kind of important for all of us. Let's go forward, see if I have one more here. What is the format of the change management exam? Um, if you take the APMG International Change Management Qualification, the foundation is a closed book multiple choice exam. 50 questions in 40 minutes. Um, if you move on to the practitioner, which is about how do I apply the kind of change management theory, there's what's called an objective test exam. It's a two and a half hour open book exam where you can use the handbook as reference. It does ask you to remember change management. It asks you to apply it to a particular project, a particular scenario. So those are the two things. Essentially, it's two sorts of multiple choice question exams, but the second one is much more application. It's an open book exam. And again, part of the course will be about some of the um, uh, exam techniques about how you might do it, but we do try and focus on you know, how to make these sorts of things work. It's encouraging conversation across the people in that particular group. When change driven from the top is resisted, it's not because of poor communication. Often, yes, and sometimes because it's done badly or sometimes because it misses the, the key messages. And so the slide I had where it had um, share that kind of the, the insight, share the background thought, show why we're doing it. If we're giving people reasons why these things to be done, it often helps people understand why it's got to be done, not just the fact because I'm telling you. Um, poor communication, um, is a critical success factor in projects as well. And that links to effective change management, stakeholder engagement, those sorts of things. All of this will come into it. So absolutely, it can be part of that. And part of the leadership role is to communicate effectively. Right, OK, Donald from Cameroon. You said change should come from two people, senior manager, and I didn't get the second person. OK, Donald. Um, the message was is that when people hear about change, it should come from two people. The senior manager to give an overview of what change is happening and why, and then the details from your line manager who can put it in context for you so you understand 
what it means to you and why it's happening in your particular environment. So you kind of get the high level from, from the senior management group and the detail from your local line manager who can put it in a much better way for you. I hope that answers your question. Uh, hi Andy, great presentation. Thank you, Maya. Uh, could you recommend any sources of further reading on this topic? Well, Maya, I think there are loads of sources for this. Uh, um, it, it's certainly worth starting with the Change Management Handbook. I would certainly have a look at Cameron Green's book on change management. Within those, you can start to find lots of other things. So you can start to look at, at Peter Senge and the stuff about the fifth discipline. Um, Pete, uh, John Cotter has written uh, a nice fable about change management called My Iceberg is Melting, which is a good way of understanding his um, eight steps for effective change management. So it's worthwhile having a look at those. Um, if you want to look at motivating people, there's lots of good reads on motivation. But at the moment, if you look for somebody called Daniel Pink on YouTube, he's done quite a number of things about motivation and kind of the key areas of motivation for staff on those. Um, off the top of my head, try lots of other those sorts of places. Um, um, if you have a look at the chat, there's, there's as long as, as both of your arms, I suspect, of other places you might have a look. I don't think there's a lack of reading on this subject. There's lots to read. Right, currently going through a huge change process. Piloting change in one area. The middle managers are fully on board, but it's the higher manager that aren't moving through the change. How could you keep the middle manager motivated whilst waiting the upper levels to move through the change? Now there's an interesting one. There's a really interesting one. What we need to have is if the middle manager is fully on board, is I would hope that there should be a senior sponsor or somebody involved in that upper echelon. And maybe it's the other elements across the senior manager are. What you need is a spokesperson, an advocate in that particular area. So, you know, it's it's have we got somebody in there, and can we provide via that person, via that that sponsor, that advocate, that kind of spokesperson messages to the other senior managers of what's happening, the success, what's needed. It's difficult, absolutely, for a middle manager to kind of go, demand from the senior managers, I need this from you. But do you have somewhere up there who can become an avenue for communication? All changes require that kind of sense of leadership, that kind of senior buy-in. Who is your person and are they willing? How? What can you provide them that will enable them to kind of persuade others, key stakeholders? One of the rules about stakeholder engagement for the person delivering the change or delivering the project is that some stakeholders are best engaged by others. And I would suggest in this situation, as middle managers, it's difficult you persuade upwards to manage upwards. Who have you got at that level that you can use as the persuasion? That may be a much more effective way of getting their agreement. So let me just move on to the next one. How can you develop your people through change? Well, one of the, the simple thoughts here, and this comes out, is that learning is change. If you want people to change, they have to learn. So do we have an environment where all of your people are being encouraged to develop new skills, try things out, are being allowed to, to, to learn things? Um, there is some anxiety about learning. People kind of go, I'm too old, it's too difficult, I haven't got time. Can we make it easy? Can I support them in doing those sorts of things? And if people can learn new skills, new ways of doing it, then you'd be quite surprised about what they will then try and do having done one thing. So it's, it's sometimes it's that kind of, something. if I move first the two important and something I can learn, something I make sense of something, then I might try far more things in the future. So it's, it's, it's sometimes what little things can we help them develop? How can I do these sorts of things? So that's uh, to kind of keep that one going, I suspect, is to think about the process. How do you encourage middle managers who are resistant to change themselves? That's a good question. Um, and I guess that comes back from my statement at the very start, which is they're often seen as the corporate concrete. One of the things there is, what will be the benefit? What will be the advantage? Um, when we look at change and projects, we talk about stakeholders. One of the things we try to sell people is, is why this should change, the benefit of change. But the benefit to the organization is, is often quite different to the benefit to the individuals. What's in it for them? Um, it's often called the whiffen factor. What's in it for me? Do you understand who these middle managers are? Do you understand what would happen if they didn't? 
if you like, the, the, the survivor anxiety. But can we show some value, some benefit to them personally? So show some empathy. Why are they resistant to change? Is it fear? Is it the lack of learning? Is it they don't want to do something different? What is it about what makes them up that might be the trick of them to do it? And that's the kind of thought process we have to understand the individual sometimes. So if there is some change, it's uh, what will happen if they don't, if like the big stick, and the encouragement, what can they get from it if they do? So on a simplistic one, we kind of have that kind of approach. Um, one of the things you can start to, to look at, you know, well, if you did change, where would you be in the future? If you have middle managers who want to develop to you know, progress in their career, can we show how it would work in those sorts of things? So. You know, Put themselves in. You know, if you want to be X, Y, and Z in the future, and the senior management, what do you need to understand now? It's those sort of four processes. It's going to be quite personal, I suspect. So it may be every person on an individual basis. There may be groups. And right, moving on. How would you advise? Sorry. How would you advise a frontline member of staff that has not been told about a forthcoming change and the change being announced before being informed? Now. This is actually quite a difficult one, is if that frontline member of staff needs to know before the general announcement that something's happening, then it is important that they, either as individuals or group, are talked to before it becomes common knowledge to everybody else if they're not being affected. Um, if this person is directly impacted, it's almost kind of making them privy to that, that extra information, that the reasons why. because. If they find out at the same time as everybody else, that kind of maximizes the shock and makes the, 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 the Kubler-Ross curve much worse. So can I um, actually you know, pre-warn them, handle some of the queries, allow them to go shock through the shock in a kind of private way rather than everywhere else, particularly if they're the one primarily affected. So I would try and ensure that their line manager is the person handling that. Um, if not, then it it's do we have somebody else who is appropriate to provide that message to them? Um, my first instinct would be it should be the line manager doing that. But you know, that's the line manager having that kind of uh, facility for change and dealing with those sorts of things. Let's have a few more. Do you have any advice to middle managers who are not getting the access to senior management or flexibility to work in the beneficial structure you've outlined? Basically, what does a middle manager do with a poor senior manager? Um, one of the things here is if, if I give you an example of as, as a project manager, I was given a sponsor, somebody at a senior level, who had never been um, a sponsor before. And what I need to make sure is that we were going to work effectively together. And so my approach to that was, was to, to book a meeting with them and, and kind of introduce myself and say, you know, I've been appointed to be the project manager for the project, which I believe that you're in charge of. And when they said, yes, yes, it's one of my projects, I said, okay, as your project manager, what do you expect from me? And essentially what I got from them was a list of things that they expected to do in the data they manage the project. I said, okay, I can do these things, but in order to do this, I need this from you. And so what I then went down was went down all the things expected from me and kind of, you know, I can only do this if if I have those sorts of things. Now, if there are things that they really want me to do, then essentially they need to kind of backfill and submit. So there are one or two things they've said, oh, actually, that's not possible to do, so well, I'm, this will be impossible, so that's fine, I will take care of it. So what happened was that we went through and kind of identified how we were going to work together to actually do this. But it was me almost prompting that discussion to ensure that, although they didn't understand the role, they understood how we were working together in order to achieve the project. So it was that kind of thought process of it's almost, you know, um, it's making it their problem, not your problem, so that you can agree a working relationship. Um, the problem is if they're very busy people and they're not making time for this, then it's never going to get resolved in the short term. But it is about almost trying to have that kind of conversation. Um, the flexibility there, you know, do I have some time for thinking? Is, is a nice to have. I suspect it doesn't happen. Um, the organization I work for always said it should be part of your working week. So we'll see how we go from there. Uh, uh, let's see. More questions? Uh, it's the same one again. It's good. I can move on. How does, a junior, how does a junior staff affected by change adapt to his or her environment, whether old workplace or new workplace? Um, 
if you're joining an organization or if your organization is changing, one of the things here is, is, is it clear what's expected of you? Are there clear objectives, behavioral patterns, has it been outlined? Um, one of the things here is, uh, have, have I had a conversation with my new manager um, in a new role or with my current manager to say, when this changes, what's expected of me? What's expected of me? Um, a job or an admin says, what do they want you to do? Are there any changes in behavior they expect? Are they expected to work in a different way? And I would suggest this is often, should be part of almost your development appraisal process because it is about, you know, well, I've not done that before. What help and support do I need? It's almost engaging it in that particular way. If your organization has a good appraisal kind of support process, then a lot of that would actually come through from those sorts of things. If you don't, then it is almost, you know, can I prompt that discussion, which is almost back to the last discussion about as a middle manager, how do you affect a senior manager? It's as a member of staff, what does your manager expect from you and, and can you agree a way you're working together? The one thing I would say, it does have some confidence from you to have to prompt that discussion. But if you're confident enough to do it, that is a good starting point forward. Specific exercise, uh, do you have any specific exercises that you would use to enable managers with low levels of emotional intelligence to develop change management skills? Change agent skills, sorry. Um, one of the things to look at is that um, if you do have, if you have people with low levels of emotional intelligence, it's to look at what areas of skill do they need. Um, if we talk about facilitation of those kind of meeting management stuff, is the start on no meeting management skills, developing the skills to run a meeting, both procedural stuff and then adding in the people stuff. And if they can then start to see how structured events, meetings run, can I add then the facilitation skills to do so? Um, communication skills, listening skills. And within organizations, there are many courses that are run that look at those specific sorts of things. Um, one of the organizations I worked with um, use what are called the Huthway Verbal Behaviors. Now, those were originally developed for use within sales organizations to help you understand what was going on in the conversation. I found them particularly useful in facilitation and in meeting management because they allow me to understand what's happening in this meeting and how are people are behaving. So, um, I, I can't give you a specific exercise just off the top of my head there. It's looking at what resources you have and what specific elements within the emotional intelligence arena need to be developed. And sometimes it's, it's almost practicing the behaviors to enable people to develop the emotional intelligence to support those things afterwards. What can I learn to do and how does that help me? And that starts to develop the lower levels of emotional intelligence as we move forward. Uh, what happens to middle managers who aren't incentivized enough to act as change agents? And that's an interesting point about motivation. What motivates you to, to, to do these sorts of things? What are the sorts of things that uh, motivate you to do things further? Um, earlier on to an earlier question, I talked about Daniel Pink. Daniel Pink says that motivation um, within things, if like, within the working environment, are often based on three things. Autonomy, the ability to do more work by themselves without outside interference. So, as a middle manager, you know, if you can do more things that change your team, that enable you to be you know, change agents, to improve change in your organization, does that mean that you get more opportunity to work by yourself without direct control from above you? Mastery. If I learn some of these skills, skills that make me better at doing my job, does that actually improve how So uh, Daniel Pink talked about mastery. Uh, as a middle manager, are you as good as you can be at what you're doing? And can you learn some more skills to make you better? Because if you are good at working by yourself and you're excellent at the job you do, if your current organization doesn't incentivize you, it may be that others might. But by showing you've developed those skills yourself, um, the last area that, that Daniel put to is purpose, am I making a difference? If you can show that you're making a difference to an organization, if your organization you currently work for doesn't value that, then by having a record of that and being a proof of that, it may be that other organizations or other areas of your own organization might value that quite a lot. So again, if you look at kind of the areas of motivation, it may not be pay, it may be other things you can learn but that gives you opportunities in lots of other areas, hopefully. Uh, let's go through. So if there's a couple more questions. 
Most times, middle management decision to it tends to lean towards favoring senior management rather than frontline staff. How do middle managers address such issues when in that position? I guess the concern comes with um, what is the decision about? If the decision is that there is a change that's being forced from on high that you have to implement, then you may have to implement that, and that does favor senior management. I would always suggest at that particular point that I would be completely honest to my staff and say, this is being forced on me as well. This is not necessarily something that I would agree with, but this is something we have to do, and these are the reasons why it has to be done. And I would always give the reasons why, not just I'm having to do it, you've got to do it as well. I would give the reasons why. It's understanding that kind of context. Um, if it's something that should be about looking after my staff, then I would hope as a manager that me and my staff are you know, the core of what we do, and I would hope that if it was something that was going to have a negative impact on my staff and their ability to do their job, that I would stand up for them as a manager. And again, that does come in the context of you know, what are the consequences of doing it. But the important thing there sometimes is that if you believe it's wrong, do you have to have that conversation sometimes and say, actually, this is not right? If I just move forward. How do you get by from groups that are used to working in a, I guess it's a, a single manner, go through an exhibition trying to get buy-in from us after a siloed approach to one of being global? Um, one of the things, if you if you have groups of people that always worked in that kind of siloed manner that are of used to working, we just cover what we do, it's one of the points there is what were the benefits in cooperating with other things? Um, there are exercises you can do which look at uh, collaboration and all those other sorts of elements. So, so what I suggest is, you know, again, it's sometimes networking, it's sometimes those kind of um, manager events. It's bringing people together and showing how you might work. Um, and sometimes, again, it's almost then raising the, the, the thing of, if we don't do this, what would happen? The survival anxiety, what is the need for change? So it, it is about, can I show, A, some negative sides of not doing it, and B, some positive sides of doing it. Um, and it's to show the wider context sometimes. Um, if people have never worked in that environment, it is quite a difficult one. So there can be some significant changes going on here. For example, back in Kazakhstan, we have a manager of petrification that only deals with data activity, and procrastinates all staff when director asks him um, how to motivate the director for this position to develop something new for the business. One of the things there you have to consider is, is what will be the advantage of doing so? What is the benefit for this manager of delegating work to the staff so they're not just doing the day-to-day -day and looking at opportunities? So if we're doing appraisal and feedback and development, let's be honest, if they're not doing development, Survival anxiety. What happens to their job if they are doing? That? If they're looking at new things, what does that do for the organisation? What does that do for them as an individual? Um, often, as stakeholders, we are essentially selfish. Can we get something that would spark this manager? And part of the question here is: Is why do they only deal with the day to day? Why are they not looking at those other things? Um, and if we understand that better, we might answer that question better. Um, I'm going to move on rapidly. I still have quite a number of questions. Uh, question says, hello, how long should it take the curve of change in an organization? Approximately. Um, you've just asked, how long is a piece of string? And the simple answer is, I can't answer that question. It will depend on who the individual is, what the change is, what their experience of change is, and what the experience of the organization is in terms of support. All of those factors can make how long it takes to go through the change, the curve, quite different. It can be a very short thing or a very long thing. Um, and as a manager, it's about monitoring that to help people through it. And it can take some time. Um, it can be even longer if it's about personal issues as well, because change in, in personal life goes through exactly the same kind of process, but it can be even longer. So if I can move on. How do program managers help senior management see that they need to invest in change rather than force it and with no additional resources? One of the things about here is if you're trying to do a program of change within an organization, you have multiple projects. 
it is about almost, if you like, a resourcing issue here. There's also a capacity issue of watch how much change can you deal with at that particular moment in time. So one of the things you have to see here is, is what's actually possible with the resources that you have committed to that particular change. Um, and what would happen, what the risks are of trying to do it with less resources or no resources. So again, what we're starting to talk about here is, is survival anxiety, um, but also the risk to the delivery. If we don't support this appropriately, what might happen? So within the program, do you have a good risk procedure, and are you highlighting the risks of forcing it through, of not investing in people, of not investing in stakeholder engagement, um, of not investing in change appropriately? appropriate resources. Um, I would suggest those sorts of risks to that process are quite significant and should be raised quite clearly. And if you can help them understand, and it, it's, it's a, the delivery of the failure point, that might be a way of negotiating more resources for that particular problem. But raise it something formal, raise it as a risk. Moving forward. Interesting question. How do you facilitate change in an environment where the leader that built the processes has now left and so are anxious and so are happy for that change as that person was perceived as not lacking change? Um, <coughs> there's an interesting one there. If, you, if the person that's created all the processes has left, it does leave you in a situation where as the people who are left behind, do you want to retain some of those and improve what you've got? I would suggest here that the danger is throwing away all your best practice with the things that aren't best practice. What works, what, dis what doesn't? What are people anxious about um, and what are people happy about? What are the opportunities that you have? Um, and it's, it's look kind of dispassionately sometimes at what works and what doesn't um, and what, what's therefore worth changing. It is worthwhile sometimes picking up uh, um, the areas that people have concerns and taking it forward um, and allowing people some comfort zone of let's leave those things in the past. So if you're going to do that, it's be clear on what you are going to change and what you're not going to change. Um, that comes to essentially uh, what's Bridges' model for transition. Um, it's being clear on, on what's changing and what's not. And by being clear on those sorts of things, you might help people with some of their anxieties and give people an opportunity for, for development as well. I'm, I'm, most of them we are moving on beyond the time we anticipated, so I'll answer a few more. Um, what type of changes are we talking about here? Can you give an example? I think when you talk about changing an organization, you can talk about anything. You can talk about you know, restructuring your department, you can talk about new processes, new systems. Change can be a fairly small thing, changing the process of changing a computer system, or could be huge, changing how the organization operates at a fundamental level delayering, moving to a global organization, acquisitions. All of these changes require some kind of change management. Um, the bigger the change, the more that you need the change management and the more stakeholder engagement you need. The smaller, the simpler it is sometimes for people to do. But remember, all, all changes will have some impact. It may be a small one, which we can deal with quite quickly. Earlier in your talk, you mentioned middle managers and their empires. Surely some of the reasons to change would be self-defense or self-preservation as change often perceived to thin the middle management layer. Your thoughts on how to manage this, please. Absolutely. Um, it, <laughs> empires or, or you know, built structures there have been created because people have, have done change in the past and this is the result of that change. If we're now suggesting change to, to do that, then, you know, this is going to be perceived as a bad thing because it's losing those that that kind of um, you know my little empire I've built. Part of what I'm trying to say is if we can engage middle managers and go, what would be the, the benefit to you of it doing this? Now, the, the the perceived thought about thinning out middle management. This is a, an interesting one. I was talking to somebody else earlier on today, um, offline about something else. There have been lots of examples where you know, to remove the blockage, let's just thin out the organisation. Let's remove the middle layer, and essentially we have the kind of senior management talking to the, the kind of the frontline staff. Let's flatten the organization. And, and one of the things here is that, that there is an optimum size for a team. And as an example, having seen that done, we had a manager who actually had 75 reports to them, 75 people reporting to the same manager. 
And the manager found it impossible to manage 75 people because it's just too much. And so what started to happen is they started to put in um, people in between, kind of you know, team leaders, sub-team managers, they were called. Essentially what you're doing is you're rebuilding that manager management layer, but calling them something different. And so my experience, and this is a purely personal experience, is that sometimes that thinning out the layers has a kind of temporary effect, is that those layers start to keep um, come creeping back in. My personal view is, if we can engage the middle management in change and in that there's a beneficial effect in change, it gives them more experience, it gives them more um, opportunities to do something different, to learn something. It may be about that it's an opportunity to move up. If I understand more about this business, I can move somewhere you know, further in the, this organization. So I kind of personally believe it, it's sometimes better to try and engage them in the process. Because if we've got their buy-in, maybe they're willing to give up bits of their empire because they maybe it's taking on other bits of somebody else's empire. Or it gives them more freedom to develop something new. And I have seen managers that have given up bits of their little empire because it gives them an opportunity to develop new bits of the empire, essentially almost the flux and transformation. If I'm not managing that, I can go and build something else extra and new. So it's looking at what motivates those sorts of people. What can I do to do so? So there is a thought process that goes in. If I just move on to those. Is the approach going to be similar or different for non-profit and for profit institutions? Um, again, this is part of a conversation I was having with somebody else offline um, earlier on today. Essentially, change is changing organizations. If you're a not-for-profit, a non-profit organization, profit organization, you might have a different metaphor that works for you. You might have a different way of working, different kind of responsibilities. But change has to happen to all of these organizations. And there are some common things that we need to do to adapt to that. Now, how we do it, it might need to be varied. There's no single right way of doing change. So yes, the approach needs to be tailored. But I think there are some themes and tools we can take from both sides and, and do change in, in either of those institutions. Um, and I think that actually we can learn from each other. And as a trainer, sometimes part of my role is to take uh, examples from one, one scenario and apply it to others. And therefore, that can be part of how we spread change across an organization. What role do you see for HR teams, e.g. HR partners, in leading and managing change? HR teams and HR partners, if you're talking about organizational development, I think, you, again, if you're embedded across the business, you can be change agents. You are part of the middle management. You are part of the network to spread ideas across an organization. One of the classic things about this is how well do we do this? Where is the knowledge of our organization kept? How do we access that knowledge? If we're going to have change agents, if we're going to have middle managers of change agents, it's where we're keeping the knowledge of what we've done in the past of change. And I know that HR and the CIPD, the, the professional body, has been looking at knowledge management for the last you know, 10 years or so. I think as a challenge, as HR, are we enabling knowledge management across our organization? Are we enabling people to share information experience. So do you have a role in this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, is this reco webinar recorded so I can replay again? Yes, the webinar is being recorded. And yes, you will get access to both the recording and the slides after this webinar is finished. Question. Not exactly middle managers. How do you do with senior managers who do not want to tell middle managers or general organization the reason or need for change? That is a really interesting question. If we have senior managers saying we're going to change, but are not giving reasons to do so, I would suggest that in that organization, we're going to have a lot of people questioning why we have to do this. In order to motivate people, people don't go to work to do a bad job. They need to know why we're doing things. What's the purpose behind it? Um, if we're just telling people that they have to do it, then I think what we start to get is confrontation. Um, as an example, if I were to just use the news today, I might go, you know, maybe a, a, a minister of health and, and some of the people who work in the health service. Um, what we have is confrontation here. What we don't have is 
is why have we got to do it and have we got some common ground we come to an agreement on. Um, if you don't share all of your reasons and your reason behind why you want certain things done certain ways and you're not willing to listen, I think we get confrontation and conflict rather than collaboration and resolution, which I think is perhaps a more healthy way of moving things forward. Um, that was purely personal opinion, not a... <laughs> question says, the approach you recommend seems very effective in those instances where change goes top down. Do you have any tips for making change happen in a bottom type, or top type company? Um, one of the things there would be is, um, one, we need middle managers and managers in the middle to encourage their staff to do change. And so where staff are coming up with ideas, enabling and supporting that change process. I think the other thing then is then managers networking and sharing the success of their staff's changes with other parts of that business, with other parts of that organization. And one of the things there is credit where it's due. Honesty, my team have done. This is a great idea and I think you should know about it. So I think in, in that bug on a bottom up company, I think our managers have a huge role in play in recognition, motivation and sharing that across the organization. And if you have managers that are willing to do those sorts of things, I suspect what you find is that your teams will come up with lots of ideas for change. Moving on. Where has been your greatest success and why? Um, as a manager, I would say one of the things, and it comes almost to the previous question I talked about the bottom-up approach, um, I would say that I, I borrowed a poster I'd seen one of my co my friends have. I put it up in my department as a way of encouraging my staff. And the poster was uh, a quote from George Bernard Shaw. And people, uh, lots of people standing against the wall with their head in square holes. At the end, there's a person with a round head looking at this square hole and kind of shaking their head. And underneath it, the quote was, the reasonable person adapts themselves to their environment. Therefore, all change is due to the unreasonable person. And the important point there is sometimes you have to go, no, that's not right. And this needs to change. And I think my greatest success as a manager was encouraging my team that they felt they could come to me and go, I'm going to be unreasonable. This is not right. It's got to change. And therefore, supporting my team in doing those sorts of things. Um, Similarly, as a trainer, it's been about enabling similar sort of things. But I think as a manager, I would suggest that would be my greatest success. Question. When change is driven from the top, is resisted by a middle manager, is not due to poor communication um, of the need for such change? Absolutely, it can be. Um, if middle managers and if staff don't understand why the change is happening, if we're not giving them the reasons, then you get resistance. I don't know what's going on or why it's going on. Um, people react quite badly to kind of essentially bullying or threats. If we can explain why the need and what would happen if it don't, then I think that yes, change is much better accepted. So poor communication can be the root of many of the need of resistance. But it's understanding the reasons why resistance happens. So moving on. Often middle management are measured by financial management and this is often a constraint on being bigger than what is required. This is where senior managers are not in agreement with doing things as a direct result. How do you get support? Um, and I guess the, the thought process there is, what are the key measures of, of this business? If it's purely about the finance, then part of that must be, if I just keep doing what I'm doing at the moment, then I may be efficient today, but tomorrow when the world changes, I'm not going to be efficient. Part of effective management is not just looking at the finances today but looking at the finances tomorrow. Investment in change. So what would be the benefits of me having two hours a week where I could think about something? Those two hours a week might save a lot more time and money in the future. So if we're going to work on that strictly financial basis, it's almost that kind of informal business case of, well, what's the value in, in investing time in change? Um, and getting support is, can I sell that idea? to someone. So the idea of a business case is about selling a proposition. Can you persuade somebody? Can you sell a proposition so they go, that's a good idea, go and spend some time and effort on it? Because I see the value of what we're getting back is much better. Okay? 
If I move on. Any tips for spotting tackling where people are appearing supportive but are actively working behind the scenes to stall derail? Um, yes, I, I, it's the um, it's the it's the walking it's the talking the talk but not walking the walk kind of stuff. It's uh, where people are saying yes but actually doing no behind. It's the follow up to commitments. So the sorts of things to do is can you give them things that have got to be on a timely basis and can you ensure those things are done appropriately within the time scale that's agreed. Um, if they're not being done you have a simple measure of they're not being done. So it is about having that kind of things that you've got uh, evidence of, of what's going on and then you can start to tackle that kind of non-compliance, the non-conformance stuff. Um, it's the do you capture rumours? Are you picking up some of the the not the informal methods of communication so you understand exactly what's going on? And it is about utilising all of those sorts of communication methods and feedback mechanisms to pick on those sorts of things. So it can be about active work and actions that are taken, or it can be other things you're picking up. How do you get managers involved in the change when they are busy with the business as usual? This is actually a critical one is that if we want middle managers, in fact, if we want managers, full stop, senior managers or, or middle managers to get, business, to get involved in change, they have to have the ability sometimes to do so. If as a manager you're being asked to be the sponsor of a project, you're being involved in change, you have to commit some time to do that. If that means you've got to take time out of your day, that it probably means that you need to be able to delegate some work to other people. So one of the things is how do we get them involved is, well, if they're saying I'm too busy, can we help them find things that they can delegate to other people? Can we find other people that might take some of the burden off them? Uh, or is it appropriate they're involved in change? Sometimes we send deputies along. If the deputy has the authority to make the decision and they have time, use them. If they don't have the authority, it may be, well, rather than sending the deputy to the work, could the deputy take over some of the things that you're doing in the background? What can be delegated? Um, the problem is, if we have management that are not delegating anything, one, we don't learn anything, and two, if they go off sick or not in the office, that doesn't get done. We have no contingency. So it's trying to sell that idea of retaining all the knowledge themselves. It might be good for them in the short term, but it's very bad for them and for the organization in the long term. It does mean that they kind of get pushed into a pigeonhole, and if that pigeonhole is no longer needed, neither are they. So can I send that kind of message sometimes? Would you agree that all managers are able, that not all managers are able to facilitate the necessary discussions? If so, how do you get around this with your middle management? Um, I would suggest that some level of facilitation is part of a management role. As a manager, you have to run team meetings, and that requires some facilitation skills. You may not be an expert facilitator, so what I would suggest is, is that you can run some events, but it may be if you have something particularly difficult, do you know of people who are absolutely skilled facilitators? But I would suggest that um, some facilitation skills is a necessary skill for all middle managers, otherwise your meetings will probably not work very effectively. It may well be that you want assistance. And I have known that to happen, where middle managers say, we're going to start a meeting, and I brought someone to assist me in facilitating the meeting. It means that you can contribute. It's still your meeting, but you have somebody to making sure it works well. And therefore, it's knowing where those resources are in your organization, because there will be people in your organization who have those skills. That's the same question. Uh, the question says, does a particular organizational structure ensure easier change control and management are always issued the same? Um, I think I've answered a similar one earlier on. Um, all of the management structures deal with change in a slightly different way. The issues are not always the same, and they come with different management structures. So there are always pros and cons to all of them. None of them particularly bad or, or shouldn't be used, I say. Um, but it is about dealing with those individually as you look at your own organization. And every organization is unique in its own way. It's, it's tailoring your approaches to those sorts of things. Uh, do we need to get Agile on board? As there's the whole company of solution. I think I've answered that one already, so I'll move on rapidly. I have the books. I think I've mentioned that one on record. My second question is, if change is not properly managed, it can out of control. What mechanisms exist for middle management? to manage and keep control of change. Well, 
the mechanisms are in place are things like project management, program management, in terms of the structures you use to deliver change, and then um, the, the controls within those about making sure that you aren't doing uncontrolled change on what you're actually trying to deliver. Um, it's building in the appropriate level of stakeholder engagement and change management to buy in people as you go through. So it's to look at not just the people aspects, perhaps the functional aspects, project management, program management, Prince2, MSP, those sorts of things. Do we have the right kind of change in place? And one of the things to consider here is portfolio management. Are we trying to do the amount of change that we as an organization can actually cope with? Um, it is not unknown for organizations to try and do too much in one go. The idea of portfolio management is to look at your capabilities as an organization and linking that to your strategy, what amount of change is actually possible? And therefore, making sure you don't try and like, bite too much, take too much on in one particular go. So those sorts of mechanisms exist. I would suggest you have a look at those as well as kind of practical tools to use. Hi Andy, how can we motivate frontline staff when their middle managers are leaving during periods of change? That is a that is quite a difficult one. It is an interesting one. Remember, if middle managers are leaving, that does give opportunities for frontline staff. We're well, talking about promotion. Yeah, maybe it's temporary, maybe it's permanent. Uh, it's about development of the organisation. So there are some natural kind of motivational things we can use in there. Um, if staff are leaving because, oh, sorry, if middle managers are leaving and their message to staff is that this is a terrible thing, I'm getting out before it all goes horribly wrong, one of the things as an organization is we need to try and manage how that's being done. If the middle managers are leaving because they're in the um, self-blame and depression area, their, the impact of their messages may have a hugely negative impact on their staff as well. So as a management team, can we manage that person so that their negative views are not impacting on their staff? Which says that actually as other middle managers and senior managers, are we providing more support to staff in that particular uh, kind of point? So it's, it's kind of, we know your manager's leaving, but we're going to come in and it's, it's providing the positive messages to perhaps counteract the message they may be seeing from other people. But it's to be aware of those um, and, and to manage that particular process. Because if you if you can't deal with the people who are spreading bad news everywhere, it will spread rapidly. So that is quite an important one. When change is a very lengthy process, any tips on how you keep staff engaged over a long period of time? One thing that it just comes out of communicate, 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 and it's different messages. If we communicate too much too early, we may build an anticipation of change before it happens. And therefore, it's about building momentum in an appropriate way. So it's what you have to look at is, is the appropriate momentum. We don't want this momentum to drop. We don't want these people to kind of if we like, peak too early. Again, it's an organizational choice. Um, it's what would keep people involved. One of the things that's always suggested is success stories. What's worked? Who's doing it? And if you can name, show real people, real success stories, people who've done it in the organization, that if you like the frontline staff, that any staff can go and talk about, can say what's going on. It's sharing that. Demonstration always trumps argument. I might tell you it's a wonderful thing. If I can show you other people who've done it and how it's working for them, this will have a much greater commitment and building that kind of commitment over a longer period of time. It may be this tough stuff in the middle, but if people can see that other people have got it right, it's much more likely to work. So think about that as the kind of thought process. That's one of the stakeholder kind of principles we should adhere to. How do you encourage traction for change when inertia is such a comfortable place for middle management apart from the threats of job security? Um, job security one is always there. It's, it's, if we think about motivation for people, um, job security is one of the things that gets people to turn up. And, and telling people that their job is not secure, what happens is it makes them dispirited. It doesn't really motivate them. What are the positive things that would motivate that group of people? Um, so if you start to look at the motivational tools, so you look at Maslow and Herzberg, Daniel Pink, um, uh, Donald Super, lots of these people start to talk about the sorts of things we're talking about. The other nice model of this is called unfrilled analysis. Then it starts to look at what are the forces for change and what are the resisting forces. 
And if you can identify those sorts of things, then you can start to identify what can I do to increase the, the driving forces, what can I do to minimize the resisting forces. But if you have a look at that as a model, Lewin's force field analysis, it's part of his model for change, then that becomes a quite a useful tool to encourage that kind of you know moving past the inertia stuff. It is always a difficult one. Yeah, it's nice in the state of quo, it's warm and fuzzy. But it's about how do I challenge people sometimes? Are there any key do's and don'ts of communication? The simple answer to that is yes. Um, and it's probably too big an answer in here. There are kind of uh, you know, best practice ideas on communication. There's checklists for communication that you can actually look at. Um, there are lots of communication tools. One thing is to consider barriers of communication and therefore what can I do to minimize the barriers to communication. And there's lots of things you might consider in there. There's probably far too long as to cover it now. Um, but so if you look at any books on communication, look at the Change Manager's Handbook, you'll find those sorts of things. Um, it is a big section within the Change Management um, e-learning that was publicized earlier on. I would recommend have a look at that. If you only go for three months, if you only look at one particular section, there is a whole session based on communication. It looks at the do's and don'ts. It looks at some of the practical things in there about what to do and what to try and avoid and how to mitigate some of the failures. So it's worth having those sorts of things. Are middle management blockers more apparent when this layer is not fully empowered? If any layer is not fully empowered, to be in control of their work, then there's always an element of, well, why should I do this? Because I'm not allowed to take authority for anything. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, one of the things that Daniel Pink talked about in terms of motivation was autonomy. If people are empowered to make decisions about their job, then they're often much more willing to take chances and change and learn in that job because they can make those decisions. If you have people who are not allowed to make those decisions, then you find, I personally have found, that they are much more resistant to change because they don't see why they should. Um, so part of this sometimes is if we can empower people in their current role and allow them to take more authority and more autonomy for the work they're doing, then when it comes to their future role, they're willing to do far more because it's in their interest to learn those sorts of things. So I would go with that thought process. Uh, I said uh, middle managers like status quo, so if the change comes from fine, how can I incentivize middle managers to get on board and shun their status quo? Um, one of the things here, again, it comes back to motivation, some of the other things I've said. What are the things that, that get those middle manager? Now, in terms of incentives, it depends on what makes that, that middle manager work. Is it promotion? Is it challenge? Is it the fact they can spend more time with their family or they want to do some better qualifications? What do we have in the organization that allows people to do things that they want? So always think about personal benefits. Yes, there are benefits in change to the organization. That's what the organization wants to change. With them, what's in it for me? Do I understand who these people are and what they're going to get out of it? If I don't understand the people I'm trying to motivate, I won't apply the right kind of levers. So it is about trying to apply the right kind of levers. So one of the other things that's talked about in change is levers for change. Organizational, operational, legal, personal levers, motivation. Understanding those and using those would be the sorts of things that's worth coming along. It's 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 picking the right things. Of different managers, it would be different things. Is middle manager responsible to set up the process for an organisation? Um, it depends on how your organisation works. I think is is the only answer I can give to that. There's no single right way of setting up processes in organisations. Often, what you find is that. Um, a process within a department may have been led by the manager of that particular department. A process for a, a directorate and, and how the directorate works is often fed from the, the, the preferences of that the director of that area. Um, so what you start to find is if you want to do change, it starts to link in with how do we as our team want to change things? Can we see a better way of doing it? And I think personally change can come from any area of a business, not just the top bottom. It can come from anywhere. So it's sometimes often responsible with the middle manager to share that in terms of knowledge management across other areas as we go forward. I think we're just coming to the last couple of questions now. Um, how much would you advise that operational level workers are involved in the management in, in the change idea stage? Um, in my personal experience, the people who do the job often have a great understanding of what needs to change about the job, what works, what doesn't. And if we don't talk to them, we might miss some of the obvious things that they do. Um, 
I've also seen teams that have been essentially stuck in what they're doing and they can't see a better way of doing it. And sometimes it takes people from outside to come and go, have you thought about? So I would suggest is it's as appropriate as a cop-out answer, I'm afraid. Um, if you've got a highly skilled and motivated team who doing the job, I would involve them wholeheartedly in the idea stage because they're involved. If you've got a team of people that have kind of stagnated, then you might find that they don't have many ideas because they're doing the same thing they've done. I would suggest that in that situation, we might need external views um, to bring in and make it less involvement, but it will come from who have I got uh, and how do they behave. What, would you, what will your advice be to a middle manager who finds it difficult to effect change management if his or her superior is opposed to that change? One of the things I would try and find out is why are they opposed to that change? And um, try and find ways about it. And there are sorts of persuasion tools you can use. So, you know, um, if, you know, can I find out the reason for it? And can I show how I might mitigate those objections? So if you can find out what their objections are to the change, and if you can show how you deal with those objections, then I think you, you might try to move their buy-in. Um, it is a long and difficult process because in the end of the senior manager, they can just say, I understand what you're saying, but I still don't think we should do it. And it makes it much more difficult to do so. So it is one of those sorts of things of, of uh, what can I affect? Are there other senior managers who are for the change who might be better placed to? And sometimes you're not the best person to manage that stakeholder. Is there another senior manager who is for the change who might be better able to persuade them? In which case, can I use somebody else to do this for me? So there are two options there. Do it yourself if you find a way of doing it, persuasion, or can I find somebody else who's an advocate for the change? Did you have to show that the changes made were effective? One of the things about change is that it should always be for a good reason. Um, and sometimes about trying a change is, is if we don't know whether it's going to be an idea, let's try it as a pilot to see if it has an effect. And if it works, then we might roll it out to other people. If it doesn't work, we might go back to where we were. So changes should have some kind of beneficial, uh, some kind of benefit for the organization. And being able to measure those changes and discuss those changes is actually quite important because that then actually buys commitment across the rest of the organization. And I think I've actually come to the last of the questions there. So thank you hugely for your commitment and for your listening. Of those of you who are still, still logged on, thank you for your time. Um, I hope you found this useful and that um, if we have any future webinars, you'll come back and listen to it. So thank you very much indeed.